for every founder, startup founder that's listening to this, <laughs> you can do it in one minute. That's it. That's all it takes. And people think, you know, you need 40 pages and 50 pages of decks. I think that's a big, that was a big learning for me is like condense, be clear, be, be, you know, be very kind of like concise in your approach. Hi and welcome to Conversations with Lulu. I have a special guest with me today. Firaz Jalbout is the founder and CEO of Baraka, a Dubai-born commission-free investment app that is trying to conquer the $350 billion opportunity in our region. With just $1, you can start your investment account and start buying shares in your favorite companies. In this episode, I'm going to talk to Firas about getting started, some of his challenges and opportunities, and we're also going to touch on the volatility that has been hitting the markets this year. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. So tell us a little bit about Baraka. When did you get started? What are some of the major milestones? Yep. I mean, it feels like it's been many years. Uh, I have a lot of gray hairs because of it, but uh, <laughs> it's been since I started uh, March 2020. That's okay. when I left my kind of my last role and started to work on this project. And there's been many milestones in between then uh, from, from that point to the point that we actually launched, which was June 2021. Okay. So it took us uh, a little bit, uh, it took us about a year to get a license and to get going, to build the technology and set up an office and to get moving. And we had to battle through COVID and, you know, we're virtual for a whole year and everything. Um, but we, we started and uh, we went live. Actually, we got our license in June 2021 and then we went live in August uh, 2021. And so we've, you know, the platform, the, the app has been live since then and it's, uh, it's now downloadable in uh, the GCC and a couple other countries. So. Okay. It's a COVID baby. It's a COVID baby. Yes, it was born during COVID. Yeah. Okay, so what got you to, so for those who don't know you before, Baraka, you used to invest in yes. startups, right? So you, can you tell us a little bit more about like your days pre-Baraka? Yeah, so I, um, I spent, before Baraka, I spent five years working at a family office, uh, family office slash VC, um, and I did a lot of investing uh, there. But then before that, I spent 10 years in asset management. And, you know, that's where I learned you know, asset allocation and investing in public markets and private markets and everything. So I kind of, I invested for about 15 years before I started this journey. Okay. Um, and that's all I've ever known really as a professional career. So it was kind of natural for me to start something like this. Really? It yeah. didn't scare you? Uh, no, it didn't scare me at all. Actually, I didn't, I never felt scared about starting this kind of business. I mean, starting a business in general is scary, but not starting a business like this for me because I am, um, Kind of what I know. I mean, I was investing professionally and personally, yeah. and for friends and for you know, for for in general, it's just kind of what I did, and mm -hmm. I, I love it. I really enjoy it. And actually, kind of, it's what inspired the you know Baraka because I um, what I wanted to do was give more people access to the kinds of investments that we were making. And you know, I thought about, you know a lot of the time people would ask me where do you invest and how do you invest and. It always felt like there was some kind of secret and like quite honestly i i just wanted to tell people that there there really is no secret you know it's it's just about access and access. so uh, and so just trying to give people access to mm -hmm. to markets but what i meant was i mean you you were investing in startups and a lot of startups and you were investing at the time where startups were pretty nascent here in the region right and i assume the failure rate was quite high uh potentially um there wasn't as much maturity. I mean, now I think the, the, the market is very different from, uh, you know, when, uh, when you started investing, when I started my business as well. It's a, it's a completely different landscape. So that's why I'm saying, you know, it didn't scare you, like all of that. You, just, you still decided to, no. to jump in. Look, so I mean, I, I invested in startups. Like I, I only spent the last couple of years that I was at that family office really investing more in startups. I was really more focused on kind of global investing in... in um, in public markets, private markets, and you know more established okay. businesses. So I really only invested in startups like for the last year or two. Locally, globally, we were investing in startups. But anyway, I uh, I felt like there was a moment in time where the market was you know coming to like there was a coming of age for the for the market. And I kind of felt it like at the time that I was leaving, where we started to see more international investors invest in the region. 
Um, and you know, for me, for fintech, for instance, when I saw open banking, you know, coming online, and, and these things really got me excited. So I wasn't so scared about what was to come. It was, mm -hmm. it was, you know, and yeah, like there's there's horror stories in, in the region, as 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 you you know. But that's okay. That's a normal part mm -hmm. of of you know the startup ecosystem, and it's probably not uncommon. More, it's probably not more. Um, prevalent here than it is other parts of the world, right? Companies die, you know. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's, that's okay. So, but you, uh, you, so on a personal level, you're a father, right? Yes. You you have, uh, you're a father two of two kids, Girl right? Boy. So some people can, could become like accidental entrepreneurs. You chose to, to actually <laughs> dive into it. So how, how does that work with like the, you, you know, your responsibilities as a as a father as a as a husband and then you leaving a job and then yeah. starting your own business yeah look i uh, <laughs> i try not to overthink it because it is yeah like if you overthink it it's challenging uh -huh. right? you really you have to wait for the right moments so there's really no right moment for me i had spent 15 years in investing and i knew that the next thing i wanted to do was entrepreneurial i didn't know when that moment would be but like I had done my homework, you know, something that some people know, some people don't like. I spent a few months really researching this before I jumped into it. Like I spent many, 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 many hours, you know, researching. I still have like a 50 page deck that I did that has a lot of research about, you know, how this, how I put this together. And also for, on the financial side, like I was saving aggressively, knowing that, you know, I would need some runway personally and so on. And then when COVID hit, it kind of like it all came together because it actually it seems counterintuitive that that would be the time that, that you know, launch a business. But for me, I kind of felt like if I could raise a little bit of money, I could get going. And that would be, you know, if we were going to enter a depressed period, it would be actually a good time to build a business mm -hmm. and that we would come out of it. And it actually didn't even last, you know, as you know. So like, you know, well, only, well it lasted, <laughs> but like, you know, the markets, you know, and for our business, the yes. markets, it didn't really, it wasn't depressed for too long. But yeah, on the, on the family side, I mean, uh, obviously I talked to my wife and we discussed it and, uh, and she was supportive and uh, there's no right moment. Okay. Like it, it is what it is. Either you're going to do it or you're not. And I just kept kind of telling myself like either you, you, you're going to do it or you're not. Or it's going to be this or the next thing. And that's what I see a lot. You know, a lot of people kind of ask me like, well, you know, how'd you do it? And I just stop thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Just start. Just do it. Just do it. Okay. Right? Just do so it. you jumped in, you did it on your own. You don't have a co-founder, right? I have a co-founder that was that joined me after the founding. Okay. And so he kind of, he, he joined early and then he's, he's now a co-founder. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about Baraka then. So it's an investment platform. Can you talk us through why did you decide to get into this business? Yeah, it's really about kind of, you know, it's, it's I, I guess I'm, I'm lucky in the sense that I found I found an opportunity that would match kind of my, what I felt like was purpose and profit at a certain point in time where I felt that there was a market opportunity. And so for me, I'm really driven by the mission. The mission is to get more people to invest. You know, more people should have access to markets. They should, they should understand how money compounds over time and how that's, you know, net beneficial to yourself, your family, future generations, the greater economy. I believe these things, and so I. Uh, it was. It was obvious to me that you know that that that's the thing mm -hmm. that I should do. Um, and so I'm driven by the mission. And are people in, like? I know that people are investing. Obviously, your company is doing very well. But like, what is the profile of people investing? Because you know, looking at this region, for example, I remember. I don't think I bought stocks before I was probably like 35. Yeah. Uh, we start late in the region. Yeah, yeah. and, and you, you, you think that this is not for me, this is too complicated for me, I don't understand it, I don't want to get burned. Uh, so how, how do you tackle this? You tackle them kind of like one by one over time. I think that we, what, what we can do is create a platform for people to invest. And in our case, it's self-directed investment. So it is people coming on our platform and deciding what they want to invest in and then you know using us as the platform mm -hmm. to do that. So our focus has always been to try to create something that's incredibly easy and intuitive to use and 
it's just accessible. You know, like you don't have to, I think a lot of people feel really overwhelmed when they open up some of the other, you know, competitive apps and they see like the competitors apps, I should say, see a million buttons and a million charts and many different things that like 80% of the population doesn't even use anyway. Mm -hmm. And so we tried to make it as kind of user friendly as intuitive as possible. So that's just to, meant to make people, you know, feel okay, you know, not not anxious about investing. And I think that's one part of the mission. The other thing that we kind of focused on very early, on, very early, was on making it, and we'll continue to do this, and you'll see us continuing to do this, is making it more part of your lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And so we start with the news, right? We before we started the app, before we started the investment app, we we started a newsletter. Interesting. And the idea was to make, you know, an investment newsletter that was something that was easy to read mm -hmm. and got you potentially interested in the market, but also just became informative. You know, it just becomes like it's a two, three, four minute read that like you just pick up small things, small bits and pieces about the market. And I think that's a big part of it is like, you know, creating content that uh, that normal people understand I, I, uh, to, get, uh, to get interested in it. Yeah, right? I, I get the I get your daily newsletter, and I think it's great. Um, it's you. it's it's written in a very um, easy way, as you said, easily digestible. And then you you break the story, and then you say why it matters, so that also you bring yeah. in a bit of context. Um, I think it's I think it's great. It's a great way to get updated on what's happening in the markets yeah. here as well uh, as well as globally. Yeah, I mean, it's also like, you know, our, our core audience doesn't necessarily want to read Bloomberg and whatever, CNN or whatever other platforms. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they are accustomed to accessing things in a different way. They shop in a different way. They game in a different way. They, you know, they, they, their life is, you know, it's just, it's just different. Who, who's your audience? Let's talk a little bit about that. So who's, who's investing today? So we... Um, I'd say that like 70% of our user base is between 18 and 30, so they're pretty young. They are predominantly uh, local, so they are people of the, you know, the six GCC nations around us. And yeah, they are, I think uh, we, we kind of run surveys and ask questions, uh, and I think 50% are first time investors. So we're capturing a very young audience that is investing for the first time, mm -hmm. and will hopefully kind of continue to, to uh, use us over time. And, and where do you see your, your responsibility as a, as a platform? Because, for example, like I, I wanted to tackle this later, but we'll tackle it now since, sure. you, since you spoke about it. I mean, the markets this year have been extremely volatile, right? There's a lot going on in the world uh, from inflation to a war. Yep. Um, everything's down. I mean, if you look at some of these like uh, growth stocks uh, year to date, like I looked up a few uh, before before this, like if you look at Uber, for example, it's down, I think, 40 percent. Uh, Delivery Hero, maybe 70 percent. Uh, There's horror stories. Though. Yeah. So <laughs> so uh, so what's how do you deal with that as a as a platform? If I'm let's say a first time investor, I come in and I buy, I don't know, Twitter, and all of a sudden, you know, uh, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Look, I think um, that is that is the market, right? That's always been the market. Markets are cyclical; they go up and down. People make money and people lose money. Mm -hmm. We don't give investment advice, so let me just be clear. That's I mean, the point is not that. We don't hold your hand in the market. We never have. We've never come out with the proposition of saying, let us invest for you. That's, that's not how you know, we do it. A big part of our mission is to empower people to the point where they feel like they have enough confidence to make responsible investment decisions. And that means that like, people need to learn the lessons of responsible investing, dollar cost averaging, investing over time. You know, the, these things matter. We try to do that by, you know, pushing content to this effect. Again, we don't give investment advice, but we do try to educate as much as possible. And so if you go on our website or you're in the app, you can read about a topic that we think is important. It's educational in nature. It's, it's not telling you to buy any stocks or anything like that. It's about things like dollar cost averaging, like what is a stock? It's, it's as simple as what is a stock and it's as complicated as, you know, mm -hmm. how do I invest in this over a long period of time? And, that kind okay. Of thing. 
Uh, and so we try to educate as much as possible uh, with the content that we have. On our platform today, we don't have, there's no margin. You know, we're not doing 500 to one leverage okay. on crazy products. It's nothing like that. It's, uh, it's, it's very controlled from that perspective. Um, and so I think getting started, losing a little bit of money in the market is, is, is natural. What you do after the fact is the most important thing, right? I think the other thing that we try to educate on is educate about is is how you should feel. You know, we can't we can't do it to the extent that we want to do it because mm -hmm. you know for regulatory matters. But like, but you know, people, you know, once you're investing and you're losing money, and you know this, and we were having discussions about investing before, is that you feel bad. You know, your stomach turns when mm -hmm. you see how much money you're losing. But if you look at the history of the market, and the past performance doesn't dictate how things happen in the future, but if you look at the history of the market, you take the S&P 500, you know, that's returned on average about 10% a year for the last 30 or 40 years. So mm -hmm. like, if you have a long-term view, you're generally doing okay. You just have to keep investing. The people who really get it, you know, the worst are the people who invest when Tesla's 100 and it goes down to 20 they and then they pull their money out. But the people who generally do okay are the people that like, if they believe in something, they, they keep investing, mm -hmm. they dollar cost average, they wait a certain you know amount of time and, and markets generally come back. But okay. So you mentioned dollar, dollar cost averaging a couple of times. So for, for the listeners, can we clarify what you mean by that? Yeah, it's just the idea that like, if you have $100 to invest, mm -hmm. you shouldn't invest that $100 immediately. Okay. At one point in time, you should spread it out over, you know, multiple intervals. So like, let's say over 10 periods and just invest systematically over, over, you know, 10 different periods of time. And that will give you an average of the cost of whatever you're buying. And so, you know, as markets go up or they go down, you're buying at a specific point in time, let's say at the first of every month or the 15th of every month or whatever, and you're just buying whatever at whatever price it is. And that means that you just average the price. And so this is a very important element in it of, of investing. It means that you are less, less susceptible to a massive crash because, you know, like we, like we said, in the example of Twitter, if you buy at 100 and it mm -hmm. crashes the next day to, at 20, then you're down 80%, that's, that's rough. But mm -hmm. if you keep buying, right, if you did your first tranche of $10 at 100 and then your second at, at 20, then your average is. You know, okay. Average, and then you, you kind of build your portfolio that way. And what's the period of time? Is there like a standard or it's up to no, you? It's up to you. It's up to the individual. Okay. Yeah. Do you do you do that yourself? Do you add dollar cost average? Uh, I no actually, <laughs> but I do have a long term view. So okay. so when I do buy stocks, um, first of all, I buy stocks and companies that I think I understand. Exactly. Uh, so I haven't really bought stocks and companies that I that are in industries that I don't know anything about. Exactly. Because honestly, I think you need to spend time to educate yourself as well. And most of us don't have that time. So either you spend the time or you just stay away. Do you buy ETFs? I haven't bought ETFs. No. So there you go. I haven't you can bought ETFs. Just buy the so can you explain? Can you explain ETFs, please? An ETF is like a bundle of stocks. Mm -hmm that either mimic like a, an index or a theme or have a, a, you know, a thematic approach to them or whatever. So for instance, the S&P 500 ETF is like you're buying 500. So the S&P 500 is an index of 500 different stocks mm -hmm. and 500 different companies, sorry. And it's like you're buying a share of every single company, mm -hmm. but in one security, one product, which is an ETF. And, and Following on what you said before, so if you buy the S and P five hundred, then basically you are probably looking at around eight to ten percent return per year. Yeah, I mean that's been the historic around. I'd yeah, be careful because yes. you know, we don't. But that's that's been the historic return over the last thirty or forty years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's diversified enough. Uh, you're yeah. not taking on the risk of individual stocks. Exactly, and so the idea is that you you know you mm -hmm. you can put your money into something that is well diversified and if you do it over I mean again like over time like we have people on the platform that transfer every single month and they buy the same thing mm -hmm. over every single month and you can see it's just a systematic approach to investing mm -hmm. it's almost like autopilot right mm -hmm. um, I didn't know that you had to do it periodically 
So I thought that you can buy basically when the, the stocks are down. If you still believe in the company, you can reinvest. Of course, of course. But I didn't know that like that you, you would do it irrespective of where the price point is, you know, if yeah, you choose no, to do I mean, it periodically. There's, there's different strategies. I okay. mean, if you follow the market and you're happy to reinvest when you see your, your existing positions down 50 mm -hmm. or 60%, mm -hmm. that's great. Mm -hmm. But I think a big thing that people don't realize is that the way you feel when a stock goes up mm -hmm. and the way you feel when a stock goes down are terribly different, right? Of course. Like you feel really good when a stock goes up. You feel smart. You feel very smart. Yeah. You start, you know, investing, dropping more money in. Yeah. But really, I mean, in general, you want to be buying stocks when they go down, hoping that they, I mean, hoping, assuming that they're going to come back, right? Mm -hmm. This is generally the way that you, that you, um, want to build a portfolio, but it's not easy for people to do that because they're seeing their kind of, their existing investment going down and you have to, you have to really believe the long-term nature of the market to, mm -hmm. to, to, to do that. So it's really, I mean, what we try to do is kind of get, like educate a little bit more about how you should feel, you know, what you should be doing, but we can't, you know, we can't actually do that for you. You have to kind of but you have an opportunity there. I mean, if you're saying 18 to 30 year olds are the majority of people investing on Baraka, uh, that's that's great. I mean, basically, yeah. it means that they should have a long term view. Of course, they're still very young. Uh, yeah. They're starting young, which is great. Mm -hmm. um, so on the on the content side, I think there's you know it's an opportunity for for you to keep educating and uh, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and we'll do more of it, and we'll try to make it more interactive and. And like, you know, get people to really kind of engage with us on it. Mm -hmm. I think uh, there's some exciting stuff that we're doing around this. So, I mean, you do you do operate almost like a media company as well, <laughs> right? With the with the with the daily newsletters. I also saw that you're working with some some influencers. Yes. So why why are you doing that? And like, what's the you know our, what was the uh, rationale for that? The approach with influencers is that this is a genuine belief of mine is that we, you know, investing particularly in the region, but globally, and I think more so in the coming few years, is it's really, you know, it's, it's become almost about community. And I think that people really kind of, they really listen to people in their community. And, you know, that can be kind of in your, in your friend circle or your uh, or online increasingly. Mm -hmm. And so what we see online is that there are people who um, who kind of you know share their insight on, on financial markets and we you know we don't subscribe to the theory like we don't, we don't want people to like the, the idea is not that people share information about a stock and go buy this and that's not that's not the point. The point mm -hmm. is that like there's a communal aspect there that you know there's lessons that people pass on to other people. And so we wanted to give an opportunity for, for some of these um, individuals to kind of share that with, with others in the app and on social media. Because I, ultimately I feel like, you know, the average, the average person wants to, you know, we're a brand, we're a company, we have an objective and, and they, they are interested in kind of like learning from other people. And I think it's a very like, it's a societal mm -hmm. thing and increasingly we do it online. And so we wanted to offer the forum to do that, but obviously like, you know, to control, like the message is, needs to be clear. It's not about kind of driving interest in a specific stock or anything like that. Mm -hmm. It's about, it's about spreading the message of investing and getting more and more people to kind of uh, discuss and, and feel comfortable within their community about investing. So, so that's why we kind of... And has it worked? Yeah, it's been good. I mean, it's, it's been great. Um, and that platform will develop over time. Uh, it's not we're not done with it and so I think there's also like what, what's really exciting for me is like it's the, the creator economy is something that we that we really interested in mm -hmm. and I think that that is going to grow and I think that we want to position for, for that over time mm -hmm. um, and so we'll continue to kind of build different things and try different things in, in, in that space yeah I think the newsletter definitely has a lot of room uh, as well still to uh, to grow, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, with uh, stock twits. Yeah, of course. Yeah, so you, you also get a daily newsletter and uh, and uh, opinion and updates exactly. and so on. But now people don't want to read. Yeah. So it's about true audio and video, mm -hmm. and so you know we'll see what we have to do there. It, it, 
tastes evolve and, and they change and people want to do different things. So it's really about just keeping it fresh. Mm -hmm. And that's not easy, what I've come to Well, you're doing a great job. And yes, I think a key time. learning here, which I think is very interesting, is that you started before you launched. So yeah. you started with the newsletter before you put the app out there, which is very interesting because normally people wouldn't do that. Uh, yeah, we had a lot of time because we, we were applying for a license and uh -huh. it took quite a long time. So we thought, hey, we might as well get things going. <laughs> but turned out to be a good It was decision. good. It was good. Yeah, it was good. So we spoke about the volatility, right? And uh, so we're, we're startup founders yeah. and fundraising, I think, has always been a challenge in our region. Things are changing, as you said. Uh, first of all, you were part of the Y Combinator yes. um, <laughs> Accelerator. Can you, tell, can you tell our audience a little bit about like, the significance of being on there and, and what is Y Combinator? I mean, it's an it's a accelerator program based in the US and the, you know, they've graduated some of the largest US well, global companies, tech companies, uh, Airbnb and Coinbase, and there's, you know, there's numerous examples. I think if you add up all of them, something like they've created like a trillion dollars of value or something, something ridiculous and it's pretty incredible. Um, and so it's a great program. They've done an amazing job. They're now doing more global, uh, more global outreach. And so we did the summer batch in 21 and it was an amazing learning experience for me. I got to hear the stories of, you know, Airbnb and multiple other platforms from, from the founders. Mm -hmm. And then the, it was like a, uh, it was a three or four month program. I can't remember now. Three, um, of like three, four days a week of just kind of intense, you know, three, four, five hours of dialogue and, and activities and, and things that, you know, uh, that we had to produce for them. And, and contrary to popular, popular belief, it is not a cakewalk. You know, they, they really push you and they ask you some really uh, tough questions. You know, and mm -hmm. it's, it's not like they're not patting you on the back all the time. Okay. It's, it's very much about kind of like, you know, why do you think that you can do this? And what is your motivation? And the things that like really force you to kind of like dig deep. And but so getting into that, it is, yeah. already, uh, is already a huge milestone, right? We were lucky. Yeah, absolutely. It's, why do you think you were lucky? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I mean, I think, um, I, don't, I, I don't know what we did differently to anyone else. You okay. know, we applied, we submitted the application, you know, you record a video and so on and so forth. I think probably our passion for this business kind of came out. Uh, I, I'm genuinely driven by the mission of this business and maybe that's something that they look for. Uh, that, that's what I can say. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, we were lucky because I think it's, a, it's an incredible, incredible opportunity. It's a, it's, a great, it's a great learning opportunity, but also, I mean, their network is phenomenal mm -hmm. and it's opened up the door for us in many different ways. Yeah, so you get $120,000, correct? An yeah. investment from Y Combinator yeah. against like some equity, 7%, 7 of yeah. equity, and they open up their network for you. Yeah, and their network is incredibly powerful. Yeah. How was the uh, demo day experience? Like when you, so the demo day is basically when you, at the end of those three, four months, yeah. you are pitching to thousands, right? Thousands. Of investors all over the world. Thousands. Of and you had to do it virtually. Virtually, luckily. Luckily? <laughs> okay. I can't imagine pitching to a room. A crowd? Of thousands of investors. I mean, it's a, it is, you know, arguably the most, you know, the most prominent VC investors in the world. Yes. They're all there and you, you get the attendance list. I mean, it is, you know, it's partners from the top to the bottom. Everybody's there mm -hmm. and um, it's intimidating, of course, but it's just one minute. One minute. Yeah. So you spend. OK, so for preparing for one minute. Of, for yeah. every founder, startup founder that's listening to this, <laughs> you can do it in one minute. That's it. That's all it takes. And people think, you know, you need 40 pages and 50 pages of decks. I think that's a big, that was a big learning for me is like condense, be clear, be, be, you know, be very kind of like concise in your approach. And that helps. That really helps. You know, that really like investors see a lot of people and they talk to a lot of people and they read a lot of decks and stuff. It's not about making yours stick out because it was designed well and bright it's like it's really just about the information how concise it is and how you kind of tackle your 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 problem 
uh, and how you show that you know you're capable in, in solving this issue. So these are the kinds of things like it's it, they kind of like people think like oh you what is you know what did you learn? Yeah. It's like it's actually very basic things. You know, it's like it's like just to be concise, be confident, be like understand your business, track the metrics. But that matters, of course. But like so often we kind of lose sight of that, right? You know, we we do these big things and worry about these and you know pitch and and it's actually not about that at all. It's really just about one, two, three. So that's what I learned. So the key takeaways from from your experience then at at Y Combinator would be. Um, be concise. Be um, you know th their tagline is build something that people want. You know it's quite simple, right? Build something that people will buy mm -hmm. or use or whatever. Um, and um, you know th these these are like honestly it's it's as simple as that. And then obviously like build a great team. You know, be passionate about what you're doing. These are all incredibly important mm -hmm. as well. Right. And of course, as a as a founder, you were able to fundraise immediately after, off the back of, of uh, your demo day, right? Yeah, I mean, we, we went into YC having raised money, which you know, not, not everyone does that. Some people kind of it's the first check, uh, and they build around around it. And we had raised money, and then we got into YC, mm -hmm. and uh, and then we we raised a little bit more money. And then, uh, yeah. I it's mean, a great journey. <laughs> yeah, I mean, raising money is, I mean, uh, the other thing about, you know, the lesson from YC is that raising money is not the, any metric of success. It is really about kind of building a product and a company that people uh, want to use. And, and that's, you know, raising money these days is, you know, people can raise money. You can raise money these days. You can, and yes. Building a business is a, a whole other animal. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, I used to think that like building business was raising money, and then I got into YC and I realized that actually like it, it, it is like that's yeah. not how you build a business. It's not about raising and spending money. It's about building a business. You know, it's a really different mindset actually. So I'm curious uh, on the on the fundraising part where they um, there's a there's a whole drive now that basically investors are very much concerned about path to profitability. Yeah. You know, the whole thing that like growth, growth, growth at all costs uh, isn't sustainable, is not going to work. Uh, we're seeing a lot of um, companies, as I said earlier in our chat, you know, where their valuations have their market caps, listed companies have dropped uh, 40, yes. 50 percent. So did, did YC say something about that? I'm, I'm curious. So what because I mean, they are known for graduating high growth, uh, fantastic companies. I think, sorry, the, the biggest lesson from YC, and I, I failed to, I just, I blanked out, but it's all about product market fit. Okay. So it's about building a product for your market and making sure that, you know, it works. That is, that's the key takeaway. So it's four things, I think, if I remember. Yes. From YC. Yes. But that is, the, that is, so it's, if, if I could summarize, it's that. Okay. So can, can you repeat them again? Product market fit. Uh-huh. That's it. <laughs> okay. Be concise. Exactly. Be concise. Yeah. No, that is the most important thing that they kind of teach. Okay. You. What's product market fit? Product market fit is building a product that people will use, they will buy um, and for your particular market. Um, and that can be kind of, you know, it's proven to work when like you don't have to spend a lot of money on marketing around it and it has a natural audience and you found that natural audience. Mm -hmm. Or that natural audience. So basically, uh, people buying your product yeah. without you pushing it down their throats. Exactly. And with marketing. Sustainable over time, and you know they. And them coming back. And then coming back. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. That is that is the lesson of YC. You know, it sounds you know high level, but it's very much about that. Really, when you think about all great brands and mm -hmm. and the products that they build, it's really about that. It's about finding that thing that gets people to say like, oh, I want to invest, Baraka, or I want to go stay in a short-term rental, Airbnb, mm -hmm. or whatever. Uh, that's real product market fit. Okay, so let's go back to the profitability point. Okay. So you said the most important part is product market fit. Yes. But also sustainability, right? Sustainable growth is... is a, what are they preaching, basically, now? Look, the public markets, if you believe the public markets are, you know, dictate kind of how the private markets 
will play out, then you know that something is coming in the private markets mm -hmm. because the public markets have, uh, have really punished unprofitable companies. And so I'm not going to predict how it plays out. I, think, I don't think that, you know, that makes sense. But there is a push for profitability and it starts from the public markets and it goes all the way through to the private markets. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that there's no money for venture? No, there's lots of money for venture, especially on the early stage. Mm -hmm. But I, I suspect the way that some investors think about this now is that, well, I can buy X company in the public market. If, you know, if they're comparing, let's say a late stage company that's not profitable and won't be profitable for the next three, four, five years, probably the way that they think about it is I can buy X company in the, in the public market and they're growing at 20, 30, 40% a year, and their stock price is down anywhere, you mentioned this earlier, but anywhere between, let's say, 30 and 60% in some cases. So I can buy that company, or I can buy the non-public private company that is X mm -hmm. at whatever valuation. Which one do you choose? And so I think some of the later stage investors might be you know, more interested in the opportunity in the public markets to some extent, to some extent. And so that creates, that creates a, you know, a bit of a funding gap mm -hmm. at the end. Of, and then that will probably ripple through to the rest of the market. And so the push to profitability is absolutely real. Yeah. We feel it. I mean, I feel it, uh, you know, as, a, as an investor as well, like we're, we're starting to ask these questions a lot more. Uh, and if a company is not showing a path to profitability, then I it's think it's, it's very tough yeah, for them to get investment today. Yeah. Even though, as you said, I think, I think, right. huh? I I think there's right. a lot of, uh, there's a lot of money though. There's a lot of money. Yeah. But we don't know when, there's a lot of money today, mm -hmm. right? There's okay. And there's a lot of money for early stage. But okay. But like I think that the cycle takes time to kind of, you know, run through the through the rest of the market. It just it just feels like this time around, the narrative or the expectation has changed. You know, the the the, the expectation is has changed. Like it's I don't know if that reverses over time, and that's I think that's what we have to see. Like, mm -hmm. will the same fund be fine in six to twelve months and say like actually don't worry about profitability, go go nuts. We don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, I, could be, could, may not be. What are you seeing? The people are Tightening focused up. on profitability. Yeah. Yeah. So, so for, for, for st startup founders that are looking to fundraise at the moment, what are, you, what, what are you seeing in terms of what is like in demand, basically when it comes to uh, business models and what's not so sexy at the moment? Stuff that makes money is always good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, I don't, I, I... Like we see a lot of, for example, corporate there's... Corporate cards. Uh -huh. There's a lot of those, right? There's a lot of commerce. I'm seeing like uh, things on, on, uh, on uh, quick commerce. Uh, there's, a, yeah. uh, there's a lot of companies trying to do that. There's a lot of... Uh, you see more deals than I do. Yeah, B two B marketplaces, crypto, everything. Crypto. There's lots of crypto actually. So I mean, that's yeah, that's all. That's all kind of interesting. Uh, What's your view on uh, Web three actually? Since we spoke about fan. crypto, I uh, I'm a big believer. I think that it's going to take many many years, and there's going to be you know an adoption curve there for sure. But and it's there's you know I'll be the first to say there's a lot of junk out there as mm -hmm. well. But there's a lot of great use cases and there's a lot of opportunity in that space. Do you think this is something that the, this region is kind of leapfrogging on? I hope so. Mm -hmm. Man, I hope so. I think it's great. I mean, what, it's, it's phenomenal. I mean, look at all the companies that are coming here and, and the ripple effect that that's going to have on the broader ecosystem is phenomenal. Um, there's going to be a ton of. Are you talent. talking about like the Binance and, and, and yeah, those, the, the Kraken companies. and those companies? Yeah, all the crypto companies. You know, there's like 10 exchanges and whatever, but like it's the next layer that's going to be mm -hmm. more interesting. It's the companies that have real applications and they'll build for this market, but they'll build globally as well and they'll, they'll create a massive industry here. 
and people will learn from that and they'll create they, they'll learn and then they'll go create other businesses and I think that's good what's next for uh, Baraka get to profitability get to profitability yeah. <laughs> <laughs> good strategy <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, look, we uh, we're doing a lot of exciting stuff. I um, you know I get I geek out on like some of the features and stuff that we're gonna launch. So I could talk to you about like you know the strategy and all these things that we you know we've got in the pipeline. But I get excited about some of the you know more the smaller you know the features that we're launching and getting you know getting people to kind of like okay adopt such as certain things. Is and, there something that you can share at this stage? Uh, we can, but uh, okay. stay tuned. And uh, and yeah, I heard you have yeah. great swag, by the way. Yes, yes, we do. I should have brought you some. Yes, <laughs> I, I owe you a box. I uh, you just reminded me now. Uh, yeah, so we're 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 gonna. The thing is that we we quite have quite a bit of fun with it. I mean, we've just done an outdoor campaign, which was yes, great. I saw that on the Sheikh Zayed Road. It was cool. We we learned a lot. It was our first one, and. Um, it's just to kind of get our brand out there. We've just rebranded a bit, and uh, and it's good. Um, it How was, big is the team now? Depends which day you ask. Okay. I mean, it's like it, it's constantly growing and and changing. So yeah, we're kind of in the mid thirties. Okay. Yeah. And you're still based in Dubai for now. We are. Yeah. With the focus on the region and and working on other countries. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Nice to speak with you. Thank you for us. Thank you. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of Conversations with Lulu. To know more about Baraka, you can visit their website, getbaraka.com. As usual, please visit the show's website, conversationswithlulu.com, or you can reach out to me on social media at Lulu Hazen. Don't forget to subscribe on YouTube and Apple Podcasts to get the latest episode. If you're enjoying the show, we'd love to hear from you and please do leave us a review. For now, I wish you love and light and see you in a few weeks.